All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back for another in-person interview post-COVID. Uh, the partners are together again, and uh, we've got some great content lined up for you today. We're talking all about everybody's favorite thing, down payments. Down payments, everything you need to know, the types of down payment, the myths about down payment, the tips about down payment. And I think you're going to learn a lot. Now, this is good for whether or not you're an investor, first-time buyer, second-time buyer, what the heck you are. You're definitely going to learn something from this episode. Now, listen, we put these episodes to help you, help the community, help our clients. If you could help us, that would be fantastic. Make sure to share, like, Give us some feedback back, send us a comment, give us a rating or review. And going forward, if you leave us a review, if it's a five-star review, because we love five-star reviews, but any review and send us a little screenshot or a message afterwards, we're gonna send a little prize package out to everybody who leaves us a review on iTunes uh, or Spotify. That would be fantastic. And again, if you're loving the show, just let us know. Let us know, that's all we ask for. Anyways, enjoy the show, we'll talk to you soon. What's up, guys? You are listening to the YBR Remo Show, where we talk all things Vancouver real estate and mortgages, take boring topics, and make them interesting. Make sure to stay tuned to listen to everything you need to know how to put cash back in your pocket, create wealth in real estate, and simplify the complicated. Today, I have a special guest. We have a special guest in the studio. Uh, he, is, uh, he is known as the Mortgage Pug, and he has not been as visible lately. But he's hanging out, if you're watching the video today, guys, he's hanging out right below the screen, right with me. And uh, if you're listening to the, aud the audio, you guys need to check out our YouTube channel because you get to see all these cute little videos of the mortgage pug, right? It's, it's great here. Anyways, on with the show before this guy falls asleep. Um, guys, thanks so much for checking, tuning in today. We are, um, we're pumped as always. We're always pumped. I think we're always excited, or at least I like to pump us up. Uh, today, we're going to talk about, um, we're going to have an episode where we focus 100% on down payment myths, tips, uh, strategies, things you didn't know, all the fun stuff about down payments. And I think anybody that's listening to this, whether you're buying your first property, your last property, investment property, anything, you actually, we're going to try and make this pretty interesting here. Be between the uh, the pug snoring and everything else, we're going to make it really <laughs> interesting. So uh, without... Um Without too much delay here, we'll get right into it. And if you're listening to the uh, the show, as we mentioned, always off the hop, I got uh, myself, Alex McFadden, my partner, Dean Lawton, and Derek Williamson, and we'll guide you through your down payment journey. Let's get into it, boys. Why are we even talking about down payment today, Derek? Your favorite thing. Straight up, down payment is by far the most frustrating part of an application for the lender, for the mortgage broker, and for the client. We've probably collected 60 plus documents on a single file if down payment is very convoluted. So we wanna go through this and actually teach everybody and, and explain what you should and shouldn't do prior to purchasing. Um, we can give you guys some very, very valuable tips that is gonna save you guys and us a ton of headache. Believe me, we're okay to do the work, we'll do it, but you guys are not gonna enjoy it if, if you've done maybe the wrong process prior to purchasing. So we wanna go through types of down payment. So down payment that's actually usable and lenders are gonna accept because they won't just accept every single source of, of funds. Uh, we're gonna go through a few myths uh, in regards to what you can do and when you can do it. Uh, and then some tips for everybody to take away. These are good points. And to your point, I like all these memories and stories are just shooting through my mind right now. Basically nightmares actually of situations where people deposited $500, you know, 40 or 50 times. And, and it, you know, nobody really fully understood that and knew that going into it. So I think if you're listening to this right now, whether it's honestly, whether you're buying your first property or a 10th, like these are going to be some key points and you might learn something about the different types of strategies that you can use too. So let's just get into types down payment. Dean, why don't you take it away with like the top, you know, a few different types of down payment. We could talk through that a little bit. Yeah. I think the most common is just general savings, personal savings, which have been, you know, accumulated over time of just, you know, putting a little bit away on your paycheck and just accumulates to, to the amount that you need to, to buy your, for your first home or your, your, your second home or whatever it is. Um, but I'd say that's probably the most common. Ideally reason. it's in a bank account. hundred percent. If you're going to yes. save, don't put it in a shoe box. Yeah, don't put it under that. your bed. You yeah. cannot use that money because it can't be traced back. We yeah, we, we have had a number of clients tell us their money is under their bed, <laughs> but we always say don't tell us that because we don't want to know that. But uh, yeah, I would say most most common would just be personal savings. Yeah, and so let's clarify to that point. Can you use a TFSA 
for a down payment? And we know the answer to that question is yes. Yeah, really any registered savings account you can use, RRSP, um, TFSA, uh, really anything you can use as a down payment. Well, let's get right into RSP because you, I mean, the savings one is pretty simple in terms of being able to use it. RSP, I think there's a lot of confusion around that. The first one right off the bat is that we'll just explain there is a benefit to being a first time buyer in the sense that you can borrow up to $35,000 tax free from your RSP as long as you pay it back within 15 years. But I think the part that gets confused a lot is, uh, can I use my RSP for a down payment if I bought in the past and under what circumstances? So uh, you want to speak on that? Yeah, so you, you absolutely can. You're just going to be taxed on the on the money that you're pulling out of the RSP. So it's always it's always recommended that you, you talk to your accountant before doing that and they'll tell you the exact amount that you're going to be taxed. It's actually a pretty straightforward calculation and they'll figure it out for you. Yeah, there's a good strategy with RSPs as well. Let's say somebody has money in a savings account or their checking account uh, and they're planning on buying in, say, six months. If you actually invest that money into an RSP, you're going to get the tax deduction on your income for that year. And if it sits in that account for 90 days, after 90 days, you can use the first time buyers program to withdraw that money tax free. So now you have a tax credit and you get to take advantage of the first time home buyers program, but it only works if you plan ahead because the money has to be in an RSP account for a full 90 days to be able to qualify for the first time home buyer exemption. Yeah, it's a good rule of thumb. If you have an RSP and you've been a first time buyer in the past and maybe you don't qualify, assuming you don't qualify for the home buyers plan, you should consider about 30% of that RSP not usable. That's typically how we see most lenders calculate it for the purposes of down payment. So if you have 100,000, they're only going to consider that basically $70,000 for the purposes of, uh, of conversation. Um, there are some other key considerations that we could talk about in a separate episode and not necessarily on down payments when it pertains to RSPs, but today we're focused on the down payment component. Yeah. I'd say another very common form of down payment would be the bank of mom and dad and, and receiving a gift. We see a lot of our first time buyers utilize this uh, and anyone can use a gift. Um, it can be a little bit more challenging on an investment property to use a gift. Uh, that's something we can talk about. Um, but a gift is, is something we see regularly. Yeah, I think that's a key point. And the, the point that you brought up right away was immediate family member. Typically, the guidelines uh, basically allow immediate. Immediate is like mom, dad, sister, brother. Um, you know, sometimes that extends to uncle and aunt. That's an exception even in that case. But usually grandparents are fine as well. Um, it's interesting to note that this is de like definitely relatives. Uh, one thing to make a, a point of saying is that if you have a spouse, maybe a boyfriend, girlfriend, that is also considered an exception unless you're married. And if you're married and you're looking to get a gift from your spouse, again, another exception because they're going to ask, why isn't this person coming on the transaction and they're providing a gift? But it is doable. I just had a, a bank say no to a common law gift. They weren't, they weren't okay with that, which is, you know, it's frustrating. It's hard to explain that to somebody because they're like, well, we've lived together for four years. Like we're pretty well husband and wife, right? But it's just the bank's guidelines. Uh, they're very tight around down payment. The reason for that is the banks don't want to rip this apart for the fun of it. The banks all follow the Anti-Money Laundering Act, which is basically any funds that are going into a real estate transaction, they have to be traced back to the source, whether it's an RRSP, a savings account, a gift, you know, coming from another property, we have to prove where every single dollar came from. Uh, and it's literally proven in documentation. If we can't do that, they just simply won't accept the money. Yeah, and we, we do run into challenges with gifted down payments when a client's buying an investment property for the sole purpose of rental. Uh, typically, banks will say no if the 100% of the down payment is a gift. And that's more not from the Anti-Money Laundering Act, but that's more from um, like a, just a buying power, just a wealth power fallback, like having actual... Um, accumulative wealth is, is, is a component that they're looking at. So 100% of your down payment being gift is not really going to be too attractive for most lenders on the on the rental side. Yeah, and I think we'll make a point that that's typically with conventional institutions. So we do have access to different types of lenders. And if you're comfortable going out, you know, outside of the uh, typical, you know, top five uh, banks and conventional lenders and, and credit unions, there's generally speaking different institutions that will allow this sort of situation if it makes sense as an investment, which sometimes it really does. Uh, but I think we're, what we're talking about, to your point in your credit, is primary uh, guidelines and what people are looking for as well. So let's jump into that. So other other forms of investments. We talked a little bit about TFSAs, RSPs. Um, we have there's obviously stocks. 
uh, some people invest in stocks um, and other kinds of liquid uh, investments. You can allow that for your down payment. I think the only concern there is like what we saw recently where, where stock values dec decreased considerably. So generally when you're applying for a mortgage, the, the lender will actually ask to see the money withdrawn and into your account to show how much money you have so that you, if you, you, know, you don't lose $50,000 or 100,000 the next day, right? Yeah, like a tip on that is if you actually plan on buying a property very soon, your money should not be invested in the market. Like you need to know how much money you have. Well, not all of your money, yeah. right? We have actually seen a handful of clients that lost huge chunks of money through COVID and they had active purchases and it was very tough to get those done. And, and luckily it came back in a way like, but yeah, to your point, well, we had a, don't rely on that. Yeah, yeah. we had a client that his investments dropped 50% and he had to pull all of his money out because he had to purchase a property at that time, right? So he took a huge loss. Yeah, so key point in planning, uh, again, to Derek's point, just as a key tip there is make sure you're drawing that money before actually making that purchase so you know what you have to work with and not waiting too long. That's a huge tip to, to pull away. So let's talk a little bit about um, people who have existing properties more from an investment perspective. We talked about you know how generally speaking, a gift is maybe not the best. And, and if it is a gift, uh, it's something where it could potentially mature in your account. I don't think a lot of people know that once the once the money matures in your account for a period of time, generally speaking, it's your money, especially if it is a gift from family member or otherwise. Um, but, you know, speaking about refinancing your existing property, there's so much confusion around that. We'll talk a little bit more about myths in a few minutes here, but um, you can, in fact, use, I just want to get that out there. You can use the equity in your property to purchase multiple uh, pieces of real estate. Where things get a little bit sticky is where guidelines can come in and change. And this is lender dependent. So again, we work with different lenders. Some lenders will allow, let's say, for example, home equity line of credit as a down payment. Some will not. And some lenders will allow, let's say, the first 20% uh, to be your savings and the rest of line of credit or, or you know, a, a mix of the two. And some will not. And so I think what we should make clear is that it is possible and it is possible to use a home equity line of credit. It is possible to use a mortgage but not with every institution and with every product and every situation. Yeah, correct. It, but it, it's absolutely doable. We see clients refinance regularly to buy more investment property. So they'll refinance one investment to buy another investment property. Or for example, we've had many clients refinance their first home, their first town home that they bought five years ago to buy the upsize that they're, they're they want to move into. So their dream single family home. So they refinance their townhouse as, as an idea to keep the townhouse as a rental and then move into that, that new single family. And they, they used a hundred percent of their equity to do that transaction. And that's a really common scenario that we we're, we're seeing as of late. Yeah. And we're in such a low interest rate market that sometimes, I mean, right now, dramatically people are refinancing and pulling money out of their property and their payments are actually staying the same. Yeah. Like from an investment property standpoint, their cash flow isn't changing, but they're pulling out 50, a hundred thousand dollars. And it's because the rates have dropped so much, right? Well, this is, a, this is an investment hack that we've talked about in the past where you, you when you refinance your existing property and you're looking to buy a primary, you only need to put 5% down of that primary. So what, what the equity you're pulling out is a lot less than what you would typically need to buy a rental property. So it's a real good hack to actually getting another property for the purpose of investment. Yeah, it really you, is. You have to be moving into it as a, as a, Agreed. Agreed. And, and then, so, so you, we can go a little bit deeper around whether or not to use, uh, you, you know, refinance that as a mortgage or refinance as a HELOC. We've talked about that a lot in the past. That's, that's personal strategy dependent, what you're trying to do, where you're trying to qualify, of course. So, uh, I think the last source of funds that we generally speaking, get asked about, or maybe don't get asked about enough is what we call borrowed down payment. And we're not talking about borrowing from your secured line of credit. We're talking about borrowing from a personal loan or an unsecured line of credit or um, credit cards, anything else for that matter. And while we may or may not recommend it uh, through a variety of different means, this is something that we do get asked about and we have done them in the past. Um, yeah, it's been a little less common recently for whatever reason, but I have seen, I have had this question come up quite a bit because line, personal line of credit interest rates are actually dropping just with prime rate being at 2.45%. There are people with, with personal line of credits that are sitting around prime plus 3%. And, you know, by, by being able to utilize even $10,000 of that could get them into that, that from that, uh, you know, I guess, what would you call it? A, like a high end 
townhouse and now that bumps that extra 10k could bump them into that single family so to pay that higher interest rate on that you know small amount of money to get the bigger home that you know could appreciate more and and just have you be in your dream home it's it, it could make a lot of sense so i am starting to see that in partial scenarios I think that's actually a good point. I like the way that you position that or explain that about it being more to top you up to the next level versus just getting a down point in general. We've found that most people who do not, and you probably found that yourself, is most people who do not actually have any money for a down payment. Typically, if you're trying to borrow everything, it doesn't work because, well, a variety of reasons, but one of those reasons is that we have to now calculate that as a debt on your mortgage application. And, you know, I've seen it in the past where we have a client who say, for example, is, you know, a, a medical doctor or someone who's a professional and they're earning a lot of money now. And maybe they just quite simply paid off all their debts or they didn't have any money yet for savings and they wanted to get in. It, that can work. But for the vast majority of people, we find that if you're trying to borrow your entire down payment, often what happens is it completely, well, reduces your qualification so much to the point that you can't qualify. A perfect example, rule of thumb, is for every $10,000 that you're borrowing on a line of credit or a credit card, uh, which in some cases is hard to even get ten grand unsecured, right? That's $300 a month that we have to calculate on your mortgage payment. So that can just reduce your overall qualification. So it's not that you can't do it, but I think to Dean's point, sometimes it's more about just getting you over the edge versus the entire thing. But it is, is doable. Anything else to add to that, Derek? Just that the, the application itself, like the person borrowing the money has to have a really, really strong file in a sense like they have to have top-notch credit you have to have really strong income because from the lender's standpoint that property is a hundred percent finance there's a lot of risk to the lender right so you know going into that you have to have a really really dialed in uh, application to actually get the approval yeah so while it's not for everybody definitely worth checking out last thing you need to know about that program is that you do pay a slight difference on the insurance premium you pay a little bit more to the insurer from that standpoint for anybody who wants to know more about the insurer premiums we've done a few episodes in the past check those out we'll talk more about it in the future so let's get ready to uh myths guys uh so there are down payment myths and there are tips so we're going to kind of blend the two down we'll jump into myths now we did an episode not long ago where it was about the 15 most common mortgage myths and some of these sort of piggyback on that but we're going in a little bit of a slightly different direction Derek you you dreamed up a few of these so why don't you take the lead here about uh, a couple of these myths and we can dig in yeah we work with a ton of borrowers that are self-employed we kind of have a bit of a niche in that space and it's interesting probably 50 percent of the clients that we speak with you guys would can probably attest to this but they think that they need to have 20 percent down some people say 35 percent down which is a big number in our market uh, but they come into it thinking that right and, and i don't know how those rumors get out there but being self-employed does not change your down payment requirement it's all about the income right so if you're self-employed and you write your income down for tax purposes and you need a different type of financing in those situations you might need to have 20 percent down to achieve that but if you qualify based on the income that you're claiming, being self-employed, you can do as little as 5% down, right? And obviously it scales when you go above 500,000, but uh, that one we hear a lot. So self-employed, there's absolutely no restriction on down payment. You qualify for the exact same down payment as everybody else. Yeah, the, uh, I, I like to break it off into kind of three categories for self-employed. There's the, the, the 5 to 9.999% crowd. So basically under 10% where you are following conventional high ratio like CMHC guidelines, if you will. 10% um, is where things start to get a little interesting depending on the type of line of work. We can do programs that we call stated income, which we can actually utilize more of your business income back to help you qualify for a property. The reason that a, a lot of people say 20% down is because there's just so much more flexibility at that point. And I think we have to just make sure to make that clear is that the 20 plus percent down payment just, just, it just opens the door to a lot of different and more options versus like the concept of not buying without 20% down that's where things people get confused i think yeah one thing is super important to keep top of mind is just the down payment matrix which is what and what i mean by that is the value of the property and how much you need to put down just based on the value so a lot of people get carried away where they think okay so i'm self-employed i only need to put 10 percent down but if that property is over 500 or sorry over a million then we have to put a minimum 20 percent down so it's really important to know what you're buying so just as a takeaway if it's a million dollars or more it's definitely 20 percent down and, uh, and that's for everybody that's for, that's everybody. for everybody yeah, yeah. so I, I get that question a lot where um, people are aware that that they can put less down but they don't realize that there's that matrix that you have to follow so so i mean just to touch on that because we're talking down payment so it's five percent on the first five hundred thousand. 
Anything above 500,000 up to 999, you have to put 10% on that chunk to make it confusing. And then like you said, 20% on properties a million or over. But when you start to scale into very expensive properties, 1.5, 2 million, $3 million, they start to scale back because the risk is greater because the loans are larger. And the higher value properties are the ones that typically do fall in value when times are tough, essentially. Uh, so it's called a sliding scale. And, and the higher the property value goes, the lower the mortgage that they're willing to give you. We can't understate that enough or overstate that enough i should say about the sliding scale because that is one of the most misunderstood factors when it comes to higher price properties that i see i honestly explain this to real estate agents uh at least multiple times two to three times every single week to help them understand it let alone the clients to understand that to derek's point just to reiterate that point because i think it's so important once you get over a certain marker and that's dependent on the lender you're working with some of them are 1.2 million some of them are 1.5 million we do have a few that are as high as 1.8 Again, similar to the first time buyer or the buyer or any home buyer that's buying with less than, you know, 20% from, you know, the first 500 and then it goes up for the next chunk. It's the same situation above that 1.2, 1.5, 1.8, where you put down, let's say 20% down payment for that first, let's say 1.5 million, the amount above that. So any money above that you have to put down in most situations, 50%. Not always. And we're going to make this really confusing and throw out there a whole bunch of different scenarios. But I guess what we're trying to get to is you just want to understand there are different factors to consider for how much you're looking at borrowing when you get above that 1.2 to 1.5 range. So thanks for explaining that. Um, First time buyers. So I I almost referenced it as we were going along, get ahead of myself right there. I just want to state this one. And if you guys want to piggyback on this, one of the most common outside of that 20% for self-employed Uh, points when it comes to 20% down is that if you've bought a property in the past and you're no longer a first time buyer, you have to put down 20% down. That's completely incorrect, completely wrong. You can purchase a property as a second home. You can purchase a property if you're selling and buying a new home, whatever it is, as long as you qualify, you can do that with the minimum down payment. And I think we really want to make sure that people know that. Yeah, as long as it's your primary residence, so you're going to live in that property, you can you can do that. Or a second home. Yeah, or a second home. Correct. Yes. Meaning yeah, so, it's not a rental. Yeah, exactly. So as soon as it as soon as you say it's an investment property, you know, it's a rental property, then you're going to trigger the minimum requirement, which is twenty percent, which we'll 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 touch on. Um, but yeah, that's a good point. So just to kind of touch on the five percent, ten percent, twenty percent, it is a good goal to do twenty percent down if you can. Because if you do less than 20% down, there's restrictions and additional costs. I'd say the two biggest ones is if you're buying with less than 20% down, you're going to pay in a default insurance premium, which is actually huge. It can be up to 4%. Um, so, you know, people are paying 15, I, I saw a $35,000 CMHC premium two weeks ago that gets rolled into the mortgage. So it's an additional cost. Uh, and at the same time, as soon as you go under 20% down, your amortization is capped at 25 years. As soon as you hit that 20% down marker, you can go to 30 years. And the benefit of that is your payment's going to drop and you're going to qualify for yeah. more. You're, you're going to qualify for quite a bit more in that scenario. But, you know, it's not something I would hesitate to getting into the market if I couldn't achieve that because getting into the market is going to be, you know, obviously much more advantageous from an appreciation point of view and all those sorts of yeah. things. Yeah, to that point, guys, like I just want to, so speaking about a lot of people are saying, you had brought the point that some people want to save to get to 20% down. And while that's a reasonable idea or, you know, it's a good goal to have, at the same time, we want to consider property values and the increase. And I just want to give a quick example. So if someone is trying to purchase a property and let's say they qualify for a property around the $500,000 mark and they they have just that $25,000 down payment, that property based on a 2.5% appreciation in five years is now worth five sixty-five, $565,000. So that's $65,000 worth of potential appreciation, not to include the mortgage pay down or anything like that in that term. So my question would always be to someone that's trying to get from, in this case, 25,000 to 100,000, which is what it would take. How long would it take you to save that extra $75,000 yourself or 65? Would it take you five years to save that money? If If so, you could actually move into that property today, keep it as your own, have the principal reduction, which would occur as opposed to paying rent, 
And then in addition to that, that property appreciation will basically get you that extra money mm -hmm. to get there. So yeah, when you that. compare it to renting, like it's an absolute no brainer, right? You're paying, when you're paying rent, it's 100% going to, like it's not benefiting you at all. Right. Whereas in, especially in a rate market, like we're in right now, you're paying roughly 60, 65% principal out of your payment. Yeah. Yeah. So, so down payment, let's talk a little bit about some, some other tips to, to consider moving forward. Uh, one of those tips is, uh, the money being out of the country. And we see a lot of this cause we actually, we help a lot of people that are, are new to Canada and, and from a variety of different countries, or they're getting gifts from, from people overseas or, uh, and so forth. But generally speaking, they're bringing money. So we're talking about bringing money from overseas to Canada. The guideline there is a 30 days. You have to have the money in Canada for 30 days before closing. Yes. So, you know, I've had a handful of people say they're waiting on the money to come through and sometimes it can take quite a bit of time to get money from overseas. There's different regulations and process. Uh, so that's a big one to keep in mind because if that money is not in your account 30 days before closing, the bank will not accept it and that can obviously hinder your purchase. Yeah. And I think that is really important to consider, um, for a variety of reasons, but what I've seen in the past, and you may have seen this too, is where someone didn't get the money here in time and then they had to completely restructure their loan and get a lending option that wasn't ideal for their circumstance because they hadn't had the money here long enough. Yeah. Important to, important to note that not every lender is that option, but the lender you want to be with is yep. that way. So, so it is important to make yeah. sure you have it. This is huge. Derek, I know you're going to talk about this for sure. Your favorite one, disclosure. Okay, so we said it on, on a few of our... We're going to keep saying this, guys. Like, As your mortgage broker and professional, so we're not just a mortgage specialist at a bank. We are independent brokers. We work with you and for you as our clients. We're here to advise you. So the more you share with us about your personal situation, the more information that you give us, the more we can help you. Now, we've had circumstances in the past where I think there's just, you know, maybe there's a, a, a not an understanding as to maybe what we do or how we help people or maybe just concerned over sharing certain information where people elect to leave certain piece of information up and that causes negative implications on the lending side. Like for example, you know, maybe not telling us that the gift is coming from overseas or not telling us where certain funds are coming from in advance. We don't, only reason that we want to know this information is to help you find the best option for your needs. So definitely whatever that source of down payment is, wherever it's coming from, the more that we know, the more we can help you. I'd say that ties into the entire application too. Like everything to do with your situation, tell us, like you said, we work for you, we work for the borrower and we're gonna help you guys shape your application so that the lender, uh, you know, is appetizing for them, right? Um, whereas if you guys don't, you guys, if, if somebody doesn't tell us something and as you can imagine, if, if you go through a purchase and you remove subjects and something comes up afterwards and we didn't know about it, that could, you know, that could cause a loss of deposit, lawsuits. There's, it's, it can be pretty bad. So yeah, look at it like a client lawyer relationship. I mean, you should be sharing if you're in trouble or you're dealing with a lawyer for any sort of reason, you should be sharing everything, every detail with them. Like that's the exact same way you should look at us in your financing. And you know what, if there's something that's actually wrong and it's not the time, we'll tell you and we'll help you map it out. Right. So that maybe you can buy in six months if it doesn't work right now. Yeah. Okay. So we're going get to get into the... <laughs> <laughs> what I would consider to be the uh, least fun part of, of what we do every day. But here's, if you're listening to this and maybe you've gone through this in the past, you know exactly what we're talking about. Transferring money between accounts. So listen, a lot of people set up separate accounts for savings, maybe with their, with their spouse, maybe with an investing partner. There's a variety of reasons people use separate accounts, but for the purposes of your purchase and qualifying for your down payment, keep in mind, you're going to have to show literally a history of every single penny that goes in and out of your account, other than the obvious you know, payroll for a period of 60, 30, 60, or 90 days, depending on what you're trying to do here. And you're going to have to find every statement, every single statement. And, you know, we talked about this off the hop where we need, you know, we've had situations where we've had 60 documents. I've gone through a few recently where I swear we probably topped a hundred uh, different items. Every transfer that you do, you're going to have to prove. So even if you put a, like use an Excel spreadsheet, map it out, um, think about this in advance, move the money later. Whatever you have to do, don't transfer. 
Well, it's funny. To. It's like we mentioned large deposits, but like what defines a large deposit? I've, I've seen deposits just a thousand dollars and we're looking for a 90 day statement of that thousand dollars. And, and I've had clients where they thought it was, it was cleaner and they were, they were preparing by putting everything into one account and trying to keep be quote unquote clean. Uh, but it was a nightmare because it was like, eight different accounts with thousand dollars there, $2,000 here, and then all coming into one account and the 90 day statement showed all these transfers. And yeah. now we're eight, eight accounts, like thousands of pages. I think that's the biggest <laughs> tip to take away from this. Yeah. Don't move your money yeah. until we give you the green light. Yeah. And the green light is the lender looking at your bank statements, reviewing them and signing off. When they sign off, you can do whatever you want with your money because they're not going to come back. But that is the biggest piece. On the bank statement piece itself, mobile screenshots, not accepted. The bank statements have to have your name. We have to prove it's yours, right? If it doesn't have your name on it, the bank doesn't know whose bank statement it is. Yeah. It has to show a transactional history as well. So like I've had some people say, why does the bank wanna see what I do with my money? Right, like they're worried about because they go to the bar all the time. <laughs> the bank doesn't actually care what you do with your money, but they have to see every single transaction in that, the last 90 days in that account. Well, what, you know what's funny, what's important about that though, is we've had clients that have had multiple NSF payments and, and those transactions show up in those statements and that's where it could be potentially an issue. But, you know, so just, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, having us audit those statements before any bank sees them is, to your point, if there is an issue, we're going to be able to correct it and plan for three or four months down the road. Yep, they don't care about your bar purchases or your two, you know, your every days at McDonald's or anything like that. It doesn't matter at all. In fact, we 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 are not interested in that. You have full confidentiality with us as well that no one else is knowing other than the lender that we're working with. So that's an important point. Uh, I think lastly, don't black it out. Don't black out your name. Don't black out your account because we're just going to have to come back and get you to get that again so anyways I, I have a feeling that everybody listening to this podcast would never do any of those things so we're okay um so so guys just that's a that's a good tip to save you uh, the listener a whole whack load of time and stress of going back and forth let's just rattle off a couple more key ones and because I, I think we could probably go on for now that we're starting here forever on these I, items make sure people are getting value out of this so so uh really important to note that generally speaking most lenders are going to ask you for 90 days says so three months of history on all the money everything rsps stock TFSAs, you name it, everything. Uh, some cases, 30 days, depending on your circumstance. And besides that, I mean, they're not going to go much further. So if you had an inheritance that hit your account six months ago, generally speaking, the lender is not going to come and ask you for, for history unless we disclose it, which is fine. And we'll look for information there, but it's 90 days. One tip I, we haven't mentioned and I wanted to quickly touch on is just property type. I've had multiple clients that are looking at agricultural land with, you know, under a million dollars and they didn't realize that the appraisal was only going to appraise the first five acres of the property opposed to the 30 acres. So they actually have to put more money down because the value wasn't achieved for what they're paying for it. So that's something that is really important. The property that you're looking at always let us know when we're going through or whoever your broker is when you're going through a pre-approval process let them know the type of property you're looking for because i've had multiple clients that are looking at big acreages for seven hundred eight hundred thousand dollars and we have problems with down payment acreages land value location yeah. you're purchasing something way out in the country you might have to put more down yeah there's so many other factors but that's a good point dean thanks for sharing that one for sure yeah, just to make a little bit more sense of that, if it was a $500,000 property and say your 5% down payment or deposit uh, is $25,000, your actual purchase price is going to include your GST. So your total purchase price goes from 500 up to 525. So if you were planning on putting $25,000 down because that was your initial deposit, when you get to your lawyer's office, they're going to be asking for more money because they're including the GST in your total purchase price. Uh, and some people are caught off guard by that. So just keep in mind, if you're buying new development, the deposit does not equate to your total down payment. It's always going to be a little bit higher. That's a key point. Guys, thanks for joining us today. I hope you got a ton of value and you learned a whole bunch about down payments. We could probably keep going on forever, but we won't We won't get you too excited here. Uh, thank you so much again for tuning in. Listen, this next few episodes is going to continue to be really good. We want to make sure that we're catering to you guys. So if you have any questions or you have any topics that you want us to touch on, anybody that you think we should interview, make sure to reach out and let us know. If you haven't already, subscribe, share, like, give us a rating. We're going to start giving away gifts as well, little, little prize packs for anybody who leaves us a five-star you and sends us a screenshot. So make sure to do that. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next time.